After some massive gains in 2023, we start 2024 by meeting just a little bit of gravity. Equities are lower. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, starting the year on a nine-week winning streak. Apple receiving a downgrade straight out of the gate, and risk in the Middle East continues to simmer. From New York, we begin with the big issue. Welcome to 2024. As we enter into 2024. 2024. 2024. We've got an economy that has probably hit a soft patch, but I don't think it's going off a cliff. We see um, in 2024 the economy doing a soft landing. We will uh, actually experience this mythical soft landing. The soft landing type of scenario. You've got the Fed uh, wind at your back in 2024. More signs that maybe the Fed is going to be friendlier in 2024. We are expecting the Fed to cut. At this stage of the game, I think, you know, it's a question of when the, the Fed cuts and how much they cut. Our belief is that they're going to cut three times in 2024. We've been in the March 2024 rate cut camp. That does seem a bit premature to us. What I do see in 2024 is a more broadening out um, of performance. A broadening out of the market. The key to 2024 is to be well diversified. We have seen some incredibly, incredibly volatile movements in the market of late, and I think it's likely that we're going to continue to see that. To start the conversation for a brand new trading year, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, Samir Samana of Wells Fargo. Gents, first of all, Happy New Year, and let's get straight into it. Jim Bianco, how dependent is this market rally on rate cuts materializing sometime soon? Oh, I think it's very dependent. I think it's really dependent on yields coming down, which are a function of those rate cut rallies. If you look at 2023, you take out the AI, the seven AI Magnificent Seven stocks. The market was a slog all year until November when the bond market took off and rates came down. And then you had that massive two month rally. If we're going to have another slog in interest rates in 2024, and that's what I think might happen. I think you're going to have a slog in the bond market as well. Too. I mean, in the stock market as well, too. Well, let's go to the bond market first. The two-year yield down 41 basis points in November. In December, Samir down 43 basis points. Samir, has this market already cut rates for the Federal Reserve already? I mean, I don't see how you see it any other way, right? I mean, look, we're, we're basically forecasting between six and seven rates if you look at where market pricing is. Um, and then when you look at where kind of equities are with respect to multiples and what they're kind of embedding with respect to earnings growth, I mean, it's really the best of all worlds. And I appreciate the seasonality around year end and the start of a new year. There's a lot of hope around. Um, I guess we would fade that hope. I mean, here you've you've probably you know discounted a lot of the year end gains already. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is a great time to build some dry powder and get ready for the next round of volatility. And you may get it on, on either side, stocks or bonds. So, you know, we're not, uh, you know, tilting one way or the other. We're just going to kind of stay, you know, humble, nimble and, and ready to act. You've said for a while, fate that hope. Lighten up on tech, discretionary, things are too rosy. I remember last time you spoke to me, at least on this program back in, I think, late November, the meaningful follow through from here to the upside was unlikely. Then we had something like another four, five percent submit. What do you think is going on, contrary to what you were expecting? It's all liquidity and flows, which, I mean, look, in the short run, I mean, with January, with those 401k flows coming in, could you go on for another two, three, four, six weeks? Absolutely. Um, and that's where, again, for kind of clear-eyed, rational, reasonable investors, I think this is where fundamentals and valuations really kind of help to be a much better guide than kind of flows and technicals, which can almost always overshoot. So, you know, right now, I mean, could we keep on going? Absolutely. But I think the real way to take advantage of that is to keep kind of taking some of that, you know, those gains, take them off the table, put them aside as dry powder. And then I think as the year goes, you know, whether it's the elections, whether it's summertime, I do think you'll get some choppiness. Jim, let's talk about the pain trade. You alluded to it. Last year, the bond market was the pain trade in both directions. We closed 2022 on a 10-year at 387.48. We closed 2023 at 387.91. Now, Jim Bianco, when you think about it, where's the pain trade going to be this year? Well, given that everybody is leaning towards the idea that there's going to be multiple rate cuts, there's going to be a soft landing, and we're going to have a, a last mile move to 2% interest rate, 2% uh, inflation, 
I think the pain trade in the bond market is going to be higher yields as we go through the rest of the year, that maybe we have a no land. That's what I think we're going to wind up doing. And I think the evidence of the economy, at least through today, is suggesting that that's probably more correct than a soft landing. And so as, as yields move higher, I think that that's what's going to catch everybody by surprise, just like when yields started moving lower two months ago, caught everybody by surprise. 18 percent expect higher yields in 2024. That was the stat that jumped out for me in the fund manager survey, Jim, that came out from Bank of America going into the holidays. Just 18 percent of survey participants expect high yields in 24. How quickly has this market become one sided in both bonds and stocks, Jim, in just a couple of months? Oh, it's become very one sided. I think because of the last two years, we've seen a 500 basis point rise in the funds rate. People are not used to it, and they're trying to understand it, and that's why you get these one-sided moves. That 18% number is the lowest number in the history of that survey, which goes back about 22 years. And you will wind up seeing it go in the other direction very quickly if rates start going up, because it did back in September and October when rates are going up. So you're going to get these violent moves in sentiment back and forth because of the uncertainty, because no one can remember seeing these types of moves in the bond market you know, over the last couple of decades. Samir, does that resonate with you? It absolutely does. I mean, look, as a market participant, when you see people this, you know, tilted to one side, I mean, it just becomes so clear as to what the right thing to do is. Now, again, you know, could we go further towards a sober shoot? It, you know, I wouldn't rule that out, but with cash still paying 5%, which it really is, um, with, you know, long rates having come down the way they have, you know, it's probably not a bad place to at least maybe lighten up just a touch on duration. And again, you know, take, you know, kind of profits on the equity side. And I think right now, hanging on short-term fixed income is a pretty good idea for the coming, come, you know, couple of months. We're seeing that this morning, yields up by eight basis points on a 10-year at the moment that year of 395.94 equities pulling back on the S&P by about 0.9 percent more than 1 percent on the Nasdaq 100 this following a downgrade to Apple Barclays downgrading shares to underweight from equal weight the stock is negative 2.3 percent Kelly Greifeld has the story hey Katie hey John a rare bear for Apple according to Bloomberg Apple has 34 buy ratings 14 holds and now five sell ratings, the latest being Tim Long from Barclays, cutting Apple to underweight on expectations of soft demand for the latest iPhone. Specifically, Long wrote that his checks remain negative when it comes to volumes and mix for the iPhone 15. Making matters worse, uh, Barclays sees no features or upgrades that are likely to make the iPhone 16 more compelling. And that is a blow, since if you think about a lot of the bull cases for Apple, the backbone of those calls is the Apple uh, iPhone upgrade cycle. Obviously, Tim Long doesn't see a lot happening there. Now, there's a high bar for Apple uh, when you think about this stock. It added a trillion dollars in market cap just last year alone, and that's even though it's posted four straight quarters of declining revenue, and it faces a lot of uncertainty when it comes to China, both from a demand standpoint and, of course, growing competition from the likes of Huawei. You add this Barclays downgrade, downgrade rather to all of those fears, and Apple shares currently lower by about 2.3 percent John. Kelly, thank you. Let's pick up on one line that came out of Barclays. And Samir, I'd love your thoughts on this. This is what Tim Long had to say. We believe the continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. Samir, here's the difficulty for a lot of people. That line was true for much of the last year. And yet this stock kept advancing and closed last year higher by almost 50 percent. Samir, when you look at Apple, it's a little bit of an odd one that the core good, the iPhone, basically went X growth and the multiple on the stock kept expanding. Samir, what would you take away from that? That's it. That's the key is we ended 2022 with really low multiples, especially on those growth stocks, which left room for multiple expansion. And now as we end 2023, coming into 2024, the multiples have already expanded. So the real question you have to ask yourself is, one, do I expect any more multiple expansion? That's one of those, do you feel lucky punk types of questions? I would say no, probably you don't get a lot more multiple expansion. So then two, the question is, do you get a lot of earnings growth? And we would argue you probably don't get a lot of that either. So that's the tricky part for 2024 for investors, again, not for traders, not for people trying to play kind of momentum, but for investors, it's very difficult to see how you get the gains from either the multiple or the earnings side. Samir, what about the rest of the sector, given the dominance we've seen in tech elsewhere? Would you expect the leadership to stick there or shift elsewhere? 
I mean, probably six there, but I think honestly, tech probably loses its leadership status as the year goes, especially if you get kind of that no landing scenario. I mean, probably one of our favorite ideas right now is on the cyclical side, right? We really like industrials, we really like materials. Some of the defensives have been left behind, like healthcare, um, energy, you know, both the commodities and the, the stocks look really interesting here. So I think there's a lot of places where you can pick up really good value. And I think there's some interesting returns ahead. I just don't think it's tech right now. Hey, Jim, just final word, is that a view you share? Yeah, it is a view I share because I think if you want to get multiple expansion, you'd need lower yields, but that would come about with a weak economy and then you'd have to question earnings. And if you had a no landing, you would get your earnings, but then you would get higher yields and you'd have a difficult time with multiple expansion. So you're kind of caught in a bit of a catch-22 and you're hoping for the perfect scenario of just soft enough to you know bring down inflation, but not too soft to bring down in uh, earnings. And that's a tough one because you're trying to draw an inside straight with that kind of a forecast. Jim Bianco, Samir Samana sticking mm -hmm. with us. We are about 20 minutes out from the opening bell. Equity futures near session lows with some movers. Let's get to Abby. John, before we take a look at the stocks that are dragging on the indexes, let's take a look at one stock that reverse is down move is now popping higher. And that is Tesla. In the pre-market, Tesla had been down more than 1%, but on a better than estimated fourth quarter deliveries of greater than 484,000 vehicles delivered. The stock is now up more than half a percent. It looks like there could be some pull through on lower 2024 federal tax credits uh, in that better deliveries number. Microsoft, the second biggest weighting to both the Nasdaq 100 and the S&P 500 after gaining greater than 56 percent last year. It's best year since 1999 on that risk on rally. Well, today it's starting the year off down seven tenths of one percent. And speaking of the biggest weighting, Apple, that you and Katie were just talking about, heading toward its worst day since late October, of course, on that downgrade to Barclays, by Barclays, to underweight warning of that cooler iPhone demand, a bearish tilt to the start of 2024. Very early days, just a little bit of a soft start. Abby, thank you. Coming up on this program, rising tensions in the Red Sea. We've got significant national security interests in the region just on our own, the United States. And we're going to put the kind of forces we need in the region to protect those interests. And we're going to act in self-defense going forward. The latest developments up next. One, just to reiterate what I said before, we're going to do what we have to do to protect shipping. Number two, we've got significant national security interests in the region just on our own, the United States. And we're going to put the kind of forces we need in the region to protect those interests. And we're going to act in self-defense going forward. Again, I'm not ruling anything in or out, uh, but we have made it clear publicly to the Houthis. We've made it clear privately to our allies and partners in the region that we take these threats seriously. Uh, and we're going to make the right decisions going forward. Middle East tensions escalating. Iran sending a warship to the Red Sea after the U.S. Navy destroyed three Houthi boats. Tehran's move complicating Washington's goal of stabilizing a vital trade channel. Houthi attacks in recent weeks diverting everything from container ships to oil tankers. Shipping giant mass suspending all Red Sea transit through today to assess security risk. Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Amory here in New York City. Julian Lee over in London. AMH, let's start with you here in New York City. How are they going to contain this risk in the Middle East? Well, we heard from Admiral Kirby, and when he was asked about there's going to be any preemptive strikes as well on the Houthis, he says, listen, I'm not going to discuss this. We're not putting anything on or off the table. But they said they made the messages clear, both privately through allies, but as well publicly, that they will respond to what the Houthis are doing. Now, we've seen the Houthis go after some of these vessels that are potentially going to Israel or backed by Israel since November. But over the weekend, you obviously saw the risk just escalate and more volatility with the U.S., these helicopters coming from two U.S. carriers in the region following a distress call, two distress calls in under 24 hours from this Maersk vessel, and then they were able to sink three out of four of these or four of these boats. So the message is pretty clear right now to the Houthis, but this is really a huge risk to the Biden administration. They want to keep a lid on this volatility, and we saw that potentially happen over the weekend of how quickly the volatility in the region could really escalate. Is it a risk to commodity markets? Julian, let's go through the prices together. October, down almost 11% on WTI. November, down another 6.25. December, down 5.67. Julian, this is serious stuff. Things are fragile in the Middle East. But if you looked at crude, Julian, you'd have no idea what was coming on. What gives? 
Um, well, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we've seen a, a, a rise today of somewhere between two, two and a half percent in, in crude prices. But that's coming off these big falls that you've just mentioned. And we're still seeing um, Brent below 80, WTI below 75. Uh, this is on top of uh, all of the OPEC plus cuts uh, that have been uh, agreed and extended and then deepened for several members coming into effect uh, as of yesterday, and that still hasn't pushed uh, prices uh, above 80 for Brent, uh, 75 for WTI, even with all these tensions in the Middle East. Um, and so I, I think that these tensions aren't being ruled out, but they are uh, playing out in an environment that is still pretty weak for oil, despite a, a hefty uh, Chinese import quota uh, that has just been released for the first part of the year. Julian, how much of this is just about the number 13 million, 13 million barrels a day of production in this country, in America? I, I think that's got a lot to do with it. I mean, uh, the U.S. surprised to the upside on production growth last year. Um, that is uh, putting a lot of oil into the market. That, that's helping uh, to keep supplies uh, ample to Europe. Um, and that is, is putting some uh, pressure on the price. The other thing, of course, with, with the Red Sea, Saudi Arabia in particular has the ability uh, to bypass the southern Red Sea for its oil exports. Uh, its shipments to the U.S., such as they still are, um, either go already around the southern tip of Africa or across the Pacific to the west coast. Its shipments to Europe uh, can be loaded onto tankers sort of two-thirds of the way up the Red Sea um, and carried northwards through the, the Suez Canal, uh, thereby avoiding uh, all these areas of, of tension. It, it's really the other barrels coming out of, um, out of the Gulf, particularly uh, Iraqi barrels uh, heading to Europe that have, to some extent, replaced the Russian crude that's not going anywhere, and it's those that are most at risk. The latest number on the Bloomberg terminal right in front of me, Amory, 13.3 million barrels a day. Is that still the quiet boom in America that this White House won't talk about? Well, the world has been more awash with U.S. production and shale oil as well, Jonathan. The issue for the Biden administration is not going to be the oil market when it comes to the Red Sea, although, of course, they're going to be concerned to make sure that oil is flowing through these tankers. But it's consumer goods that is really the concern. But it is because of that north of 13 million barrels a day of U.S. production. Sometimes the administration doesn't love to tout this. Cause remember, the president ran on being a climate president. They want to lean into electrifying the grid and all that they are doing on the climate agenda, but it is an incredibly historic number, this record production we see out of the United States. AMH, thank you. Alongside the brilliant Julian Lee, to the both of you, thank you. Brent crude right now, 78.18, WTI 72.74. Jim Bianco, Samir Samana back with us. Samir, you mentioned energy. Let's talk about it. What reasons do you have to believe that that crude price is going high sometime soon? I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, it looks like the Chinese are finally starting to get a little bit of traction on some of their stimulus. I think the OPEC supply cuts, because they were somewhat voluntary, are being underappreciated. I think the fact that the SPR at some point has to refill is kind of lingering out there, and they seem to want to do it in the low 70s. Um, and then when you think about the fact that you, it's possible that maybe there is no landing, um, all those things tell me that the one trade that has probably the most ability to catch up is probably crude oil. And then I would say energy equities probably rally alongside that. Um, the fact that it's down here in the low 70s is probably the one asset class that probably does okay in a recession just because it is so beaten down, but does really, really well if there really is a soft and or no landing. Jim, do you agree? Yeah, no, I definitely do agree. I think that um, oil is uh, really going to be more of a demand story than it is going to be a supply story. And the demand, uh, as Samir said, is probably going to be about China. They've had a difficult reopening after zero COVID a year ago, but maybe they're starting to get some traction. And that means that they're going to have more demand. And oil is a fungible commodity. Dem doesn't matter where it's made as long as it's being consumed in greater amounts. And that should help to push the price higher as we go into 2024. And if OPEC plus, that is uh, OPEC plus Russia, holds resolve to their million and a half barrels of cut a month, then we should probably see higher oil prices. Jim, let's put a bow on it. We've spent the last 20 minutes or so talking about the potential for various pain trades. When you look at the range on Wall Street at the moment, Jim, and I know you've looked at the same numbers as me, at the high end 5,200 from Oppenheimer on the S&P year end this year, at the low end 4,200 from JP Morgan, that range, Jim, 
is a thousand points wide. Just how much conviction is there on Wall Street for the year ahead? Well, I, I don't know if it's so much conviction as it is about assumptions. You know, I've been arguing for a couple of years now, what did 2020 mean for the long-term outlook for the economy, that complete shutdown restart of the global economy, the reboot? Uh, if you think not much and you keep using words like rebalance and renormalization, you're probably towards the higher end of that scale, about 5,200. If you think that it has some long-lasting effects like remote work, deglobalization, maybe you know energy being more of a political weapon, you might be at the lower end of that schedule. So I don't know if it's the lack of conviction as it is, what do you think 2020 meant for the longer-term outlook for the global economy and financial markets? So make your response to that, final word, please. Yeah, I mean, look, I think here it's pretty clear. I think you've got to fade risk. I think you probably fade long-term rates just because you are getting paid so much in cash. I think you try and find those idiosyncratic opportunities like energy. But I think right now, just given what's gone on in the last few months, I think it's just a really great time to play a little bit of defense and just, you know, take a take a flyer on the fact that maybe consensus, as they were in 2023, is a little bit wrong right now. A strong start to the year, gents. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Good luck for 2024. We'll catch up, no doubt in the next few weeks, the next few months. Jim Bianco, Samir Samana. Speaking of consensus for last year being wrong, just remember, average forecast on the S&P 500 last year was 4,000 points. We finished last year almost 20% above that average forecast. Coming up on this program, the morning calls and later. If tech goes, so does the market. That's the warning from RBC Capital's Amy Wu Silverman. She'll join us around the open and bound. That open and bound is about seven minutes away. Equity futures near session lows were down about three quarters of 1%. minutes away from the up and in bell equities pulling back just a little bit on the S&P 500 a little bit more on the Nasdaq we're down almost 1% there on Nasdaq 100 futures that's the price action let's kick things off with some morning calls three of them here's your first Barclays Dan Grenning Apple to underweight 160 price target saying recent channel checks point to weakening demand your second call from Deutsche Bank Dan Grenning Estee Lauder to hold seeing limited upside due to macro headwinds and crowded inventories that stock is negative by almost 2% and finally your third and final Call from DA Davidson, Dan Grenning Hasbro to neutral, growing increasingly concerned about the company's expensive valuation. That stock is negative by about 1.63% to 50.23 in the pre market. Coming up on this program, RBC Capitals, Amy Wu Silverman expecting a volatile year ahead for equities. That conversation about four minutes away with equity futures near session lows. Your first opening bout of 2024 up next. Four seconds away from the opening bell, the first opening bell of 2024. Happy New Year to you all. In the equity market, equity futures pulling back by three quarters of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down about 0.9% following monster gains in the year 2023. On the S&P, 24%. On the Nasdaq 100, 54. There's your opening bell. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields aggressively lower. December, November, this morning, a little bit higher. Up by seven basis points, 394.63. The dollar, with its first down year on the year last year since 2020, shown some strength this morning, 109.52. That currency pair, negative 0.8%. Tensions in the Middle East. Crews still sold off October, November, December this morning, advancing just 0.7%. $72 at about 15 cents. As we kick off trading for a brand new trading year, 2024, 30 seconds into the year, equities pull back by 0.6% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down by around about 0.9. Responsible for some of that move, this one stock, 
Apple. Barclays downgrading the shares to underweight from equal weight. Abby has the story. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Yes, we do have Apple starting the year off with a bit of a bearish bang, down more than 2%, heading toward its worst day since late October. And this, of course, as we do have Barclays cutting shares, taking advantage of what can often be a quiet news day uh, for stocks, taking advantage of that, cutting the shares of Apple to uh, an underweight from equal weight. Analyst Timothy Long saying that channel checks show that demand for the iPhone 15 lackluster, expecting the same could be true for ordered the iPhone 16. In addition, he does not expect services to grow more than 10 percent. And he's saying that there's not a quote unquote bounce back for the Mac, iPad and wearables. Now, the heart of his call relative to price action is the idea that last year you had the shares of Apple up more than 48 percent, despite the fact that some of the numbers uh, were disappointing. He's saying we're going to see a bit of a reversion. He thinks holiday numbers or the upcoming report will be OK. But he's lowered his March numbers once again below consensus. He's lowered his price target, as you mentioned earlier, to one. 160 for a roughly 15% drop from here, potentially for the shares of Apple. Abby, thank you. I've said a few times already this morning, really hitting the ground running to start this week and to start a brand new trading year. Payroll's coming up on Friday. Next week, the following Friday, earnings from JP Morgan to one officially start earnings season. Some delivery numbers as well from EV automakers too. Tesla topping Q4 estimates. Rivian falling short. Ed Ludlow on the West Coast with more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Tesla currently higher, two tenths, three tenths of one percent. It's paired the earlier gain that it had following the market open. In the fourth quarter, 484,507 EVs delivered by Tesla. That was ahead of estimates, and it does mean that Tesla exceeded its target of 1.8 million vehicles in 2023. Uh, go back to a, a year ago, January 2023, the first earnings call of the year, where Elon Musk said that 2 million units would be possible in the full year. So they beat the 1.8 million official guidance, but it fell short of that kind of higher bound target that Elon Musk had outlined. There's a number of storylines within it, because even though Tesla exceeded its own targets, and the stock is higher by a few tenths of a percent, BYD, the Chinese EV maker, delivered 526,400 109,000 um, EVs in the quarter gone, meaning it now holds the crown as the standalone biggest maker and seller of electric vehicles. And of course, it has many more cheaper model variants in that domestic Chinese market. You also mentioned Rivian. Um, sequentially, quarter on quarter, deliveries fell short of estimates, even though for the full year, production of above 57,000 quite comfortably exceeded what was largely seen as conservative production guidance of 54,000. Rivian is a story of teething problems, right? A new EV player getting vehicles to customers, but there's also a demand question going forward too, John. Ed, you and I are going to talk about this in about 10 minutes' time, but let's have a little tease of the next segment, shall we? Who gets yeah. EV tax credits and who doesn't? How's that going to play yeah. out this year? You, you know, the, the rules have changed. They are now... Uh, basically 13 eligible models for the full $7,500 tax credit. It'll be interesting to see the maneuvering, right? What can the automakers do? Can they do anything to lower price, change variation on model lineup to, to increase eligibility? Ed, thank you, mate. We'll catch up in about 10 minutes' time. That stock is lower by about 0.8% on Tesla, about four minutes into the session. The latest from Dan Ives of Wedbush reiterating his outperform rating on the stock, saying this, the price war in China has finally hit a calm period, which is music to the ears of Tesla bulls. This was a clear win for Musk. Hitting 1.8 million vehicles was a major achievement in a choppy macro environment for EVs. The stock is now down by a little more than 1%. Let's turn from autos to airlines. Evercore downgrading southwest to inline after a big rally into year end. Simone Fox on top of this one. Hey, Simone. Hey, John. Yes, shares of Southwest now down about 1.8 percent in very early trading. Uh, Dwayne Fenningworth at Evercore ISI uh, maintaining his $35 price target, still about 21 percent higher than Friday's close for this name, but saying margins really below their long term potential and Southwest growth not keeping up with the overall growth in the U.S. economy. He's much hotter, however, as our most analysts on Delta. Delta shares also falling today, but this is TD Cowan's best idea for 2024. We got reports uh, over the weekend that Delta is telling pilots it's only going to hire 1,100 pilots. It had hired more than double that last year. This may be something that keeps, you know, its costs more in line with 
pre-pandemic levels. But expect a turbulent month for airline stocks, especially here in the U.S. AAA said it was the busiest year-end travel se season in history since it started tracking that data back uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, we're wa watching the outcome of the DOJ trial uh, about the JetBlue and Spirit merger that could have big impacts for the broader sector. And then, of course, you've got the consumer in China. China said uh, they'd seen a surge in domestic tourism uh, sales up 5.6 percent. But uh, our Bloomberg second measure data saying U.S. sales slowing by 6 percent in the week ending December 24th. So lots in play there. Simone, thank you. Just look at the close of the year. The rally into year end for some of those airlines on the S&P 500. November up by 15.51 percent for those names on the S&P. December up another 8 percent really strong finish to 23 for the airlines on the S&P. Let's turn to the food space just briefly. According to the FT, DoorDash planning to diversify beyond delivering meals. Katie Greifeld on top of this one. Hey, Katie. John, yeah, it's an interesting move for DoorDash. Obviously, the bread and butter of their business is delivering food to doors, uh, specifically in the United States. Now the company looking overseas as well. DoorDash CEO telling the Financial Times that the company's two largest areas of investment are expansion and penetration outside the U.S. Now, if you think about DoorDash's expansion strategy so far, it's been to target smaller markets that its competitors haven't yet broken ground. Remember last year, DoorDash expanded into Austria and and Iceland. They did that through a partnership with Helsinki based Wold. And according to the FT, DoorDash job postings suggest that the company is looking to move into Luxembourg as well. Now, news of these plans comes as DoorDash is looking for ways to invest its growing cash pile. You look at the 12 months ending in September, and DoorDash had generated nearly 800 to 900 million dollars of free cash. So quite a chunk of change there. So it makes sense that DoorDash would be looking at new markets. Shares are currently a little bit lower, less than 1%. But remember, DoorDash was nearly 100% uh, higher last year alone, John. Amazing. Katie, thank you. Small move lower. We're down by not even one percentage point. About seven or eight minutes into the session, your start of 2024 trading looks like this. We're down about 0.5%, 0.6% lower on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, down by a little more than 1% after a gain of more than 50%, 54% higher for 2023. Here's the outlook from RBC Capital's Amy Silverman wanging on the year ahead, writing this. I expect a year of mean reversion and normalization for volatility, a year filled with both geopolitical risks and political ones, like the US elections. Amy, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Amy, as you often do, as you always do for us in your brilliant way, lift the lid on your universe and tell us what is the big bet right now? Well, look, you know, it's hard to believe, John, that we're now four years away from the pandemic. And a lot of what has happened in this cycle has been really unique, really odd in the options market. You know, relationships, correlations that we typically count on uh, pretty much went the opposite direction. I think this is going to be one of the first years where we start to see mean reversion. We start to see normalization. What I mean by that is I think there'll be a demand for hedges. Equity skew is something that all but disappeared in our market because folks are much more focused on getting upside. I think that starts to change. And I think the overall level of volatility reflects is something that we'll also see in 2024. In terms of specific trades, you alluded to this going into year end. Do you think as we start this year, we're revisiting some of the trades that didn't work last year? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, when we kind of look back to the last three years, a lot of things that historically tend to work really haven't. And, and last year was a year, John, where it, it was actually just better if you just didn't do anything at all. You had the S&P up 20 percent, not a single option strategy on a systematic basis beat that. But, you know, I think we're getting to a point where it really is about how we're positioned in the boat. We were in a year last year where folks really weren't well positioned on the long side. We're much more full up in that regard. And I do think that's one reason why people will start to consider downside hedges, not necessarily because there are risks out there, even though I think there are. Actually, just simply the fact that they have something to hedge is why we'll see something like equity skew start to pick up. And, and I've said on your program many times, John, that the tails in the, in the market Market, especially in options, are really at historically low levels. There's always a ton of event risk on the horizon, always, every year, looking out 12 months. Amy, this year, no different. We need to talk about elections. I'm going to use some of your language from you and the equity team, I'm sure, including Laurie Calvacina. Why is talking about presidential elections like staring at the sun for you and the team? Amy, why is that? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that's I'm definitely borrowing a Lori's phrase there. But, you know, when we speak with investors, it's something that just falls in the category of very unquantifiable. And, you know, I hate to use the word unprecedented, but look, we're going into a year right now where, you know, the, a potential presidential candidate isn't even allowed on the ballot in two states so far as we kick off the new year. You know, we really don't know how to price that. And I'll tell you, the way the options market is pricing that is simply not at all. Now, I think that is also a function of November being quite far away in terms of elections. And we've seen a lot of tenor shortage in the options market. But beyond that, you know, it's very difficult to have a concrete way to price that outside of saying, OK, what other ballots could we see this being a risk on? You know, when are the primary? So right now, equity options are quite low. They're not pricing in the uncertainty and the risk that comes with elections. And if you look back to something like 2000, when we were talking about hanging chads, and there was just simply a question of who is on the ballot, who is the president. That was a year where we did see volatility spike. Emmy, you mentioned it. I want to build on it. The volume now that goes through zero day to expiry options, given where November is so far out, You've mentioned this and you've talked about it in your research as well, whether options and your universe can be used as an early warning of anything now, given where the volume is and where the volume isn't. Yeah, th this is a very unfortunate nuance that I think if you're not day to day in this market, you know, you don't quite pay attention to as much. But the options market used to be this great early warning system. You know, it would tell you where the concerns are one month out, two months out, three months out. The issue is when you have so much volume, S&P almost 50 percent going through something like zero data X free options, that warning signal has become shorter and shorter and shorter. It's one of the reasons folks keep asking me why headline VIX looks so suppressed, because people aren't using it. You know, people are using these far shorter data tenors. I just saw the SIBO say that they're going to start to do zero DTE on small caps on the IWM proxy. So you're going to see that not only in S&P, but in other underliers as well. And so you can't rely on that early warning system. And I think what that could create is sudden pockets of volatility that people are not prepared for. Interesting. Amy, thank you for the update. As always, we'll catch up soon and a happy new year to you and the team. Amy with Silverman there of RBC. About 12 or 13 minutes into the session, pulling back by, let's call it three quarters of 1% on the S&P. I don't think you can talk about that move without talking about the move over the last 12 months. Last year, of course, a 24% gain on the S&P, 54% on the Nasdaq 100. The Nasdaq this morning down by more than 1%. Coming up, US-China tension simmering under the surface. Part of this is also external to China. It's the U.S. push to move supply chains away from China. So there's both a push and a pull factor here at work. From chips to EVs, that conversation up next. breaking economic data for you. Mike McKee has the numbers. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, everybody, it's tough to come back to work and maybe tougher if the economic data don't go your way. Although I came in this morning and there was an analyst who said that the market's looking for a reason to fall. If you need a reason, this is the best I got for you. The S&P uh, Global Manufacturing PMI falls to 47.9 from 48.2. The expectations was it would rise to 48.4. So a little bit of a disappointment there. Normally, this comes out the same day as the ISM, but with the calendar being what it is, the holiday this week, ISM comes out tomorrow. It's expected to rise to 47.2 from 46.7. So we'll see if that carries through. And if not, then we'll make, have an interesting Wednesday. Just how relevant, Mike? ISM manufacturing, I'm looking at the numbers, sub 50 since late 2022. There's been numbers to focus on and numbers to ignore. Is that in the latter bucket? No, it's not a number to ignore. Uh, basically, people follow it for a lot of the sub indexes as well. They're going to be looking at prices. They're going to be looking at orders. And of course, they're always going to be looking at the jobs number, trying to get a hint for what happens on Friday. Payrolls just around the corner, Mike McKee. What are you looking for? Well, along with all the other data that comes out on Thursday, we get ADP and jobless claims. Uh, and don't forget jolts tomorrow. Everybody loves jolts. But uh, the December payrolls is the highlight of the week. And what's expected is 170,000, which is a bit down from where we were last month. But it's still very strong. Unemployment's supposed to tick up to 3.8%. 
that's only uh, one tick higher than it is now. So it doesn't make the case that the economy and the labor market are slowing down a whole lot. That's what people are going to be interested in coming uh, this week. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Looking ahead to your coverage of it. Looking forward to it. Mike there. Happy New Year, Mike. Appreciate it, buddy, as always. Data to focus on, jobless claims. If you're focused on that and nothing else all year, spoke to the resilience, the strength of the U.S. economy for the whole of 2023. Let's talk about China and the United States. On the surface, President Biden and Xi are playing nice. Under the surface, divisions are growing. Biden's cracking down on China's semiconductor ambitions. Dutch manufacturer ASML bowing to D.C. pressure, cancelling China-bound shipments just weeks before export bans kicked in. This is the U.S. slashes its list of EV eligible for tax credits to exclude vehicles with certain Chinese made parts. Here's your team coverage with Katie Lyons in DC, Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Ed, you and I mentioned it, just that division yeah. growing between China and the US and what will be eligible and what won't be eligible for EV tax credits. Yeah, you have a situation where if you're trying to onshore an industry, be it EV supply chain or semiconductor, the onshoring and subsidies going hand in hand with sanction to sort of make competitive against the, the foreign market. The new rules eligible as of January are basically dependent on the battery and battery components having a threshold of how much Chinese ownership the company that makes them has. It's set at 25% limit. So if any part of your battery pack or battery components uh, have some ownership by the Chinese government or a Chinese uh, state-backed entity, you've got to look for alternatives. You asked me in the teaser ahead to this segment, well, what can the automakers do? The answer is that they're working with the White House directly to adjust that supply chain. The net effect is that when there were perhaps two dozen vehicles eligible for the full $7,500 tax credit, those component rules now mean there's only 13. That's the impact. It's basically halved the number of EVs you can buy that are eligible for a full credit. So, Kayleigh, we've got to draw a distinction between the rhetoric and the policies. Now, the rhetoric's a little bit better over the last couple of months. She's speaking nicely about the relationship between the US and China, Biden doing something similar in the last few months as well. Kayleigh, when you look at the policies, do you see a different story? Well, it's a story of competing objectives, frankly, Jonathan, because on the one hand, yes, the U.S. is pursuing a normalization of the relationship with China and they want to cooperate. But at the same time, they also want to compete and specifically they want to protect U.S. national security interests. And that really is what these export restrictions and other controls are about, trying to limit China's access to certain critical technology. And semiconductor technology in particular is included in that. Hence, according to Bloomberg's reporting, the U.S. is pushed to get ASML, of course, a Dutch manufacturer, to cancel or halt immediately pre-scheduled shipments of key lithography uh, equipment. Some of those machines that were scheduled to go to China have now been halted weeks before those actual export restrictions kicked in. So that just reinforces this idea that the U.S. is trying to limit China's ability to develop its own semiconductor industry. Again, competing objectives here, and this comes back to the EV a conversation as well, John, because yes, there is the objective to wean U.S. industry off of these Chinese components, A, because of national security interests, also the desire to support U.S. manufacturing specifically, but you also have a president who is pursuing a climate agenda, and this potentially runs into conflict with that. One of the relationships to watch for the year ahead. Ed, thank you, alongside the brilliant Kelly Lyons down in Washington, D.C. Here's the broader price action for you. If you're just joining us as we kick off 2024, we're pulling back on the S&P by 0.7% on the Nasdaq, down by 1.5. The one stock to watch around the open all morning, actually, has been Apple. A downgrade from the team over at Barclays from equal weight to underweight. I'll give you some of the explanation, just a line from what they had to publish this morning. We believe the continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. That stock is lower by more than 3% now. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. We do have a broad-based sector decline today, John, uh, weighing on the S&P 500, the worst day in nearly two weeks. And taking a look at sector-wise, it looks like a few are higher, but those are defensive sectors. You have healthcare, utilities, and staples and real estate all higher real estate actually growth but the other three are defensive so the fact that they're higher that investors going toward defensive sectors is a bit risk off and then take a look at the technology sector we also have the other two mega cap tech sectors down but down 2.5 percent we have 64 or excuse me 62 of the 64 components lower the worst day since early august so that apple downgrade and yields higher really weighing on big tech today john abby thank you the latest moves in big tech 
Apple and a broader market specifically. Coming up on this programme, we'll get to the trading diary, a sneak peek of the calendar for the first week of 2024. That's next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> from New York City this morning. Good morning and happy new year to you all. About 25, 26 minutes into the session, equities pulling back on the S&P by 0.8%, on the Nasdaq down by something like 1.6, following nine weeks of gains on the S&P 500. The equity bulls have been absolutely spoiled. That is the longest weekly winning streak going back to 2004. Can we snap that this week? Early days, but the S&P is down by about 0.8% as we kick off trading in 2024. Here's the week ahead, the trading diary, the calendar shaping up as follows. ISM manufacturing numbers and jolts data coming out tomorrow, followed by the Fed minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern. Did they? Didn't they talk about rate cuts? Did they kind of talk about rate cuts? We'll find out what they publish in the next 24 hours. Thursday, another round of jobless claims. Friday, it's the main event. It's the payrolls report just around the corner from New York City. That does it for me. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the training day and the trading year. This was the Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.